inside America's boardrooms. The informational show for board members and corporate secretaries. Brought to you with knowledge partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, R.R. Donnelly, and the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals. Welcome to this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. I'm T.K. Kerstetter, the CEO of Boardroom Resources, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Once again, we're in the studios of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, which is a mentoring and training facility uh, for entrepreneurs. And uh, we want to thank them for, again, lending their studios to the show. We have a very interesting show today. We're going to be talking about uh, special committees and some other governance topics. And with me um, as my guest today is Kimberly Alexi, who's the chair of the Nominating Governance Committee for Cal Am, and also sits on the board of FireEye, Five Nine and Vizio, which is a private company. So, Kimberly, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, even though you look youthful, <laughs> you are clearly a veteran of corporate boards. Um, as I said, you sit on four now. Since two thousand five or six, you've served on eight different boards. Okay, so um, you've really had a chance to evaluate all kinds of unique situations from a public company perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're here today at the Equilar Leadership Forum, Board Leadership Forum, which is all about talking about leadership. Mm -hmm. We talk about leadership on this show all the time because we think it's a foundation for a successful and effective board. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, uh, how do you define, from all your experience, how do you define good leadership when you look at a board of directors? Um, it's a great question. I mean, I think it's, it's you know it when you see it, <laughs> and you know it when it's absent, right? But I think at a high level, it starts with effective chairs. And by that, I mean, you know, it can be the chairman of the board, the lead independent director, or even someone that just functions in that capacity. It doesn't necessarily need to have that title. But that individual and the individuals at the committee level, I think um, to have an effective board, it, it starts with having individuals that are strong and empowered in those positions that can help to set the agendas, that can make sure that every director has a voice around the table, so to draw out input from other directors that may, maybe perhaps are less vocal, um, just to stimulate the conversation and make sure the right questions get asked. So I think the, uh, the chair has a real role in that and also the follow-up actions that come out of that. So somebody that feels empowered to have that leadership is key. And then I think um, it's, secondly, to me, it's diversity of viewpoints and skill sets and experiences and gender and age and all these things that play in because I think that an effective board has different opinions and they're not all you know, the same voice sitting around the table. And to have an effective board, um, I think that those conversations need to be uh, constructive and collaborative. So I think you can get into situations where it can be less effective or even at the extreme dysfunctional if you have um, you know, individuals that perhaps aren't contributing or aren't contributing effectively, right? So, um, and I think that ties into the third piece, which is culture. Uh, I think when we all go out and recruit for new board members, people talk about chemistry being really important, the culture of the company, and, and the board has its culture. And I think trying to make sure that you can integrate into that culture, but at the same time, be cognizant of making sure that you know, you, you're representing disparate opinions and fostering a really good and constructive dialogue with one another and with management. Yeah, one of the things that wasn't talked a lot about today was the, was the leadership at the board committee level. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, that is such very important positions mm -hmm. that if those people are doing their job, it makes the chairman or lead director's job that much easier. So it really is important getting the right people in those spots. I think you're right. And I think non-gov in particular and, and comp, I mean, they're all important. But I think that, I don't want to say the audit committee is on autopilot. Uh, that's, an, that's not a good word. But, but the idea that the audit committee, it's very cadenced, right? It's around the quarterlies. I think the comp issues, 
tend to come up annually, but the, the, the obligations there to make sure that the second and third and fourth levels down, the top performers get recognized, that's more um, incumbent upon the, the chair and perhaps the chair of non-gov working with the CEO and management team to really draw those people out to get the board exposure to those people. I, I find that in non-gov too in terms of uh, CEO succession as, as well as it relates to the next level down. Having strong leadership in those roles helps ensure that that happens. And and I think that it's incumbent upon, uh, you know, good good boards. I think have strong people in those positions to help facilitate that. Well, that's a great segue into uh, as we're talking about committees into mm -hmm. what we want to talk about today specifically, and that's the formation of a special committee. Right. Okay. That's something we have not talked about on the show yet, mm -hmm. but it's a reality, particularly in M and A mm -hmm. transactions. You see that sometime, and, and other reasons. My question to you is. When should somebody form a special committee? And then what ends up being the role of that special committee in the end? Well, I think, at least the way I look at it, and I've been involved in a series of different special committees, both as a member and as a chair, and, and I think that um, there's also situations where we've chosen not to go that route when we could have. And I think when I look at it at a high level, it's, first of all, is there a real or a perceived conflict of interest? So, so by that I mean, so in the case of m and you know, the, the obvious example is a go private transaction where perhaps, you know, uh, not insignificant chunk of your management team and or maybe some of your board members would benefit by rolling over, say, their equity into that transaction. Uh, you know, that's an extreme example on M&A. Another example uh, where you see a, a conflict of interest could be a special investigation, right? There's allegations of whistleblower hotline or something else where there's a need for an independent set of eyes, absent management, absent any board members that may have been involved in certain decisions. Um, shareholder derivative litigation would be another classic example where you look at a special committee. So all those things I think are factors where a special committee could be warranted. So these are almost project short-term challenges. That's the hope. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. And obviously with investigation <laughs> that could go uh, very can go long. a long time. I was one but, involved in one with three years. <laughs> but just by definition, special yeah. means that it's meant to be over a period of time and not necessarily a permanent committee going forward. They have a goal in mind to reach that endpoint, either make a recommendation or get something solved. Right, and that, and to your point about what's sort of the outcome, the outcome tends to be a recommendation, and, and it depends on uh, the situation, but some special committees like an M&A may be empowered with even a final say on a vote. Uh, that's, that, that does happen. But uh, at the, the beginning, when you're setting up a special committee, I think it's important to understand the why behind it, who it's comprised of. Uh, that's really key, especially in M&A. You want to make sure if there's any concerns about uh, fair dealing, fair price, those types of things, making sure that that committee um, is comprised of the right individuals, and then um, and then understanding what the powers of that committee are. And usually you, that committee ends up hiring its own or outside counsel to get that advice, so they're not guessing. <laughs> yeah. So while we have somebody that has your level of experience, we always like to ask this question. We, we li like to ask you, when you look at the trends in the boardroom today and the things that are happening, what sort of gives you uh, comfort or confidence in certain trends and what trends don't you? For example, we heard recently about GE going to term limits. Mm -hmm. uh, now they extended those, again, to 15 mm -hmm. years, which some investors would like to be shorter, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, a, it's sort of uh, another way to refresh the board. Mm -hmm. um, you also, another trend might be uh, cyber risk. Mm -hmm. uh, do you form a separate cyber special risk committee? committee? Mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't say special. Right. Do you form a risk committee, mm -hmm. okay, that might focus on cyber risks and the other um, black swan risks or, or whatever? So when you look at those or others, what comes to your mind on ones that give you mm -hmm. confidence and one that gives you concern? Well, on the, um, uh, the trend toward mandatory retirement ages and or term limits, I, I really feel it's incumbent upon us as directors to, to do the right thing, which is really the, the reason that those things are imposed, in my opinion, largely, is because uh, people are not having the conversations that they should be having, which is that, okay, we have an underperforming director, 
um, and we need to address that either through his or her departure from the board or maybe there should have been some remediation. I mean, that's where self-assessment tools come in and I think that if they're used effectively, like any other performance review that we all do for our day jobs and is normal course in, of practice in, in daily life, we don't, I think, as a, as a board, as a general rule of thumb, do as good of a job as we could be doing with that process and then take that to the next step, which is address either skill sets that are now mismatched or uh, performance issues and to refresh the board proactively. So I think that's why we're in this, in my opinion, responsive and reactive situation where we are imposing these guidelines because as a group, we're probably uh, could be you know, more uh, proactive internally in, in addressing those. So I think it's a trend that I'm not personally in favor of, but I can see why it's happening. And I see that, you know, in general, this activist trend is, is a trend that's happening where activists are asking for things like this, board refreshment, uh, and I understand the reasons that, that that they're raising these issues, but at the same time, I think uh, the good news in all that is that it's forcing us to step up our game, which I think we should be doing. Well, Kimberly, Alexa, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us, and uh, we're both going to go back and enjoy the board leadership conference, mm -hmm. and that will conclude this issue of Inside America's Boardrooms. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week where we take a look at another critical topic that'll help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then. Join us again next week for Inside America's Boardrooms. Brought to you with knowledge partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, R.R. Donnelly, and the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals.